Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of the Us People Show. I'm your host, Savvy Rocks, and today I am abundantly humbled and grateful to have Dr. Princess Fumi here with me, who is a CEO, a mental health doctor, trauma care expert, 14 times best selling author, a publisher, online TV show host, an award winning filmmaker, and an online personality. Dr. Princess Fumi, thank you so much for taking your time to come on the Us People Show. She's shaking her head again and I know why. (laughs) How are you? Thank you so much for having me again. It's such a blessing and an honor to be in your presence. So I thank you. No, you are more than welcome. It works both ways in life. I always abundantly say that. So, Dr. Princess Fumi, thank you again. But please, my first question for you is, could you tell us a bit about your background of where you grew up and how that influenced you to be the inspiring person who you are today? Wow, thank you so much. That's kind of loaded. I was (laughs) born and raised in Nigeria, a West African, you know, West African region of Africa. And I ruled, I mean, my my family ruled in the Southwestern region called Imure Ikiti Kingdom, where my family has ruled. Of course, my my dad would always tell me it's since the 1280s and I always said 1400. And he made like to always tell me, no, 1280s, God, 1280s. So since the 1280s, because I know he's probably going to watch this. So daddy, 1280s. I study. <laughs> and so, but here, how many of you know that a lot of times that you might be born in a royal family, but it does not preclude you from trauma. Yes. It doesn't exempt you from trauma. So for me, even though I was born and raised in there, I did not lack things financially, but there were other things that happened in my life. Yes. At five years old, I was sexually molested. And from a- the age of five all the way to 18, and people would say, well, you're 18. Why didn't you, why, why didn't you do something about it? But I could not because that was all I knew. Mm-hmm. Everywhere I went, this certain person was there facing me. And so, but before the person passed, we kind of reconciled that. And I just forgave and left that alone. Mm-hmm. And so I brought that into my marriage in America. Mm -hmm. I brought something like that and other things into my marriage. And of course, my marriage was not perfect, right? But we were, he brought his own baggage. I brought my baggage. And how many of you know that when you bring baggage together, all you get is combustion. (laughs) All right. (laughs) It's the way you said it, but it's the truth. we, We literally combusted on each other. And thank heavens that my children, we had to shield the two boys who are three and a half and two then. Yeah. And of course, coming here again, I went into, I, you know, I was one of the ones that was number one who, um, who, who kind of gave people jobs in Staten Island. I had the largest uh, daycare centers in Staten Island. I was making millions. I didn't even know that it was millions. So we'll come back some other day to talk about that. Yes, yes. It is. Most definitely. Know your money very well. Know your know your business very well. Just don't hand it over and say, "Okay, I'm in love," and you hand it over and don't know nothing about your business. Mm. That's for another day. Then I found myself here, homeless, a someone who had who had run a multi million dollar business now homeless with two kids in their hands. That's another day again. And so when you say that, who am I? I am someone who is resilient. I'm someone yes. who's been through a whole lot that I'm not a survivor. I'm a thriver. There you go. I have survived, but after survivor, you better know how to thrive because many of us stay with that surviving and we keep surviving. We keep in that surviving mode and we never get through anything because we keep staying. We're stuck in survival. We're yes. stuck in survival mode. So I'm a thriver. I'm somebody who also helps other people to rewrite their life story, their trauma story, and thrive in spite of their trauma story. Yes, yes, definitely. Most definitely. So my next question is going to definitely tie in to this one. So can you define who you are as a person, but also who do you see when you look in the mirror? But on the reverse of that question, 
Has there ever been a time where you have looked in the mirror and not recognized the person staring back at you? How did you manage to find the strength, the courage, but most of all, the clarity to be who you wanted to be and come back? So when people on, on the social media, <laughs> they call me the deep freezer lady. And there's a reason for that because of my story. Um, for somebody who comes from a royal family, you would say, okay, I mean, come on, they should be able to take care of you and things like that. And it wasn't the financial part. It was guilt. I felt ashamed that I had gotten into a marriage, which they probably had their concerns about initially, but they just allowed it anyhow, and it failed. And I didn't want to go back home um, at 23, 24 to say, hey, here I am, I failed. So what did I do? I ended up on the streets of New York. Then I moved from this. I was going from city to city to city. Nobody would hire me, even though I had my master's degree in communications. Nobody would hire me. The only person that hired me was a 7-Eleven in yeah. New Jersey, where it was like uh, a graveyard shift in the deep freezer. And all I had to do was pack things in the deep freezer. And so it was in that deep freezer that I had a different encounter with God. Yes. It was in that deep freezer that I made, I made a pact with God. I did, you know, I said, okay, if you get me out of this, I'm going to use my life as a platform to show other people how to come out of their trauma. It was yes. in that deep freezer that God gave me a whole series called and your life purpose. It was in that deep freezer. And let me say this, prior to that deep freezer, I had attempted suicide. Mm -hmm. I want people to sit on that. I had attempted suicide. I, I was so tired of what was going on. I was tired of the disgrace that I was getting in that small little town because everybody knew things were going on with me and my husband. And they knew that I was being cheated out of things, but I could not see it myself. I was so tired of it. I was tired of things being yanked out of my life that I decided, you know what? I'm done. I am so done. And mm -hmm. I would never forget that night where I took my car to Verrazano Bridge. I don't know people. You, you know, If you have not been to the U.S., go and Google Verrazano Bridge. All right. Mm -hmm. I was in Verrazano Bridge. I pushed the pedal. And all I needed to do was to release my foot. Yes. And you know that God will meet you in the middle of your chaos. If you open your eyes, you will see. And what he did was he used what I loved, which was films. I love to make films. So he used what I, and I saw a reel in front of me. And it was a roll of my kids, my two boys crying. And they were in the hands of another woman just crying. And the Lord said to me, is this the legacy that you want to leave behind? Yes. A legacy of death, a legacy of suicide. Here is your pivotal moment. Choose. And I pedaled my way back. Did, some, did everything go better? No. In fact, it got worse. But I pedaled my way back. And today mm -hmm. I can look at my life now and say, oh my God, what if I had refused oh. to see that I just went through? I will have not only deprived my boys of their mother, I will have deprived the world of what God is doing in and through me to help other people to thrive. Now, being that you've gone through absolutely all that, now you thrive in That's what right. you do, That's right. in abundance, with gratitude, with inspiration, That's with right. compassion and kindness of what you do. And, and I can clearly see that you have so much faith, which is so important in what you do. I uh, would love yeah. to know yeah. how you help people do this now, because it's so important for people to understand this. There are so many areas that I want to cover and speak to you right. about, but I would love to start off with how you help. One of the things that you do help with is you teach wealth and health. To That's your right. audience and tackling, you know, leadership in mental health, which today hmm. is one of the biggest topics in the world. I, I tell you what, um, it doesn't matter how much plan you have. It doesn't matter how much you, you could be the best person that can put uh, a proposal together. If your mental health is 
out of, if you're out of touch, there's no way you can survive or even proceed in anything you want to do. So mental health is crucial. Now, let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, I knew that I was called to psychiatry. So I became a social worker. Then from social worker, I felt like uh, something is just not there yet because I was working with children. I was working with the elderly. I was taking them in and pulling them out. And I said, no, 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 no. I don't like this. There needs to be a help somewhere. It just can't be cyclical. So I went into nursing. And then when I went into nursing and I said, well, I want, what if I combine the two? Because so that that way I can teach people, make them see a holistic solution to their problem. Yes. So that it's not just mental alone or it's not just physical alone, but combining those two and having to be able to have solutions to those two things. So I went into psychiatry. And of course, let me tell you this, for those who are questioning what God is telling them to do, I want you to hear what I have to say to them. So I finished nursing. I finished my doctorate. And then I found everybody else running around to do their boards. And I said, eh, I don't know about this. Um, I don't know. So I went to one of my mentors and I said to her, I would never forget it. And I said, but why is everybody running around? Why are they in a hurry to do their boards? And she looked at me and she said, I guess you're not ready to do it. I said, I don't even know if I want to do it. So she said to me, don't do it. And I looked at her like, what do you mean don't do it? I spent the whole four or five years doing this thing. You said, don't do it. You said, well, but it seems like you're tortured about it. So I'm telling you now, don't do it. Whatever it is that you want to go do, go ahead. Go and sew your royal oats out there. Go. Hey. And that's exactly what she told me. She said, go sew your royal oats. I said, what do you mean by that? She said, go sew your I said, I love to write. She said, well, go ahead and go write. Yes. So I decided to take a whole year and went to Saudi Arabia. And I went to work in Saudi Arabia where God opened my eyes to a whole lot of stuff there that even the things that I, the, the idea that I had about Muslims, it kind of uh, dissipate because I, I met beautiful souls. And while I was there, they would do their Allah Akuba. And when they do that, I did Jesus is Lord. I was, I had time. Yes to praise, I had time to really tear my veil and begin to look inside, what do I really want for myself? So for those who are questioning what mm -hmm. God has called them to do, sit in it. Don't be in a hurry because whatever it is that you're doing right now is going to point you ultimately to where you're supposed to be. So mm -hmm. when I was in Saudi Arabia, the things I could not accomplish yet, do you know that I accomplished? I was the first Black anybody to grace the platform, TED Talk platform in Saudi Arabia. I could not have achieved it in America. Can I say that again? I could not have achieved it in, in, in America. Yeah. But I went, God took me and I was in obedience because I was learning. It was not time for me to practice then. I was just trying to figure things out. But I ended up in Saudi and while I was serving other people in Saudi Arabia, somebody saw me and nominated me to speak. In, I mean, think about that. A black, uh, anybody, woman on the platform in Saudi Arabia doing TED Talk. Y'all can go see it on Google. Doing TED Talk in Saudi Arabia. So that many people, they now, they didn't even know that I was royal. They didn't know nothing about me. And when they saw that, they were like, wow. Because I was talking about the power of stories. Yes. That God will give us a hiatus, a time to just breathe and say, okay, maybe I'm not sure of which way to go, but I'm going to sit in it. Mm. And whatever experience I get here is going to direct me too. And that's what happened. When I was done in Saudi, I knew exactly what I needed to do. I came home, didn't waste my time, took my boards, bam, that was it. And I ended <laughs> up having my clinics now. See, you see that? One thing I've learned in life is the power of words. That's right. The power of words and the power of communication. You deciding that you want to be a writer. Let me remind everyone. Over, I'm sure it's over 14 times. I'm, yes, it I'm, 
<laughs> yes, yes, it is. I'm I've, sure. I've, re I've written 24 books now, and out of the 24, 20 of them are bestsellers. See? 20. 20 See? of them are bestsellers, all for the glory of God. 20. See? And I'm you writing know. another one now. That, that's when you know God has given you an exceptional gift and talent which you have nurtured. But one thing I would like to ask is, when did you realize the power of words had an abundant gift to bring culturally people together to unite? Hmm. Well, okay, so where the, the, when we talk about writing, mm. I remember my mom telling me that even at the age of three, Anything around was up for grabs. I would be scribbling things all over the place until I started scribbling on documents and they didn't find that funny anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one particular story that she told me where they got so fed up, they had to go get a bunch of newspapers dumped it in a room and closed me in there and said, well, keep writing until you get tired. So I've always, even when I was younger, I've always loved words i've always loved to write yeah but at some point i stopped i stopped because i was going through a whole lot i was in so much pain with my first marriage i was going through so much and i stopped you see there are times when we're going through trauma trauma would not allow us to see through the things that we're supposed to do so we stop so when i got separated that was that writing inside of me ignited. It got yes. ignited again because now I was by myself with my own head trying to figure things out. And when I first wrote my first book, it wasn't, it was not intended to, to, to share with anybody. I just wanted relief. I just wanted the pain to stop. So I would just write journals. And then it was, I think, three years into it that I realized, wait a minute, I have about 20 journals. What am I going to do with this? So I just lumped everything together. And I started and I wrote my first book, which was Stepping Out, Fulfilling Your Destiny. Yes. And that was changed into something that beyond idol worship later on. Two years later, it was changed into another book. And so there are times you, even if you have that writing inside of you, one day, right, one hour a day, just write. Not necessarily writing to say, oh, I want to publish it, but just write. Write who you are, what you desire for yourself, solutions that you want. My vision, your vision torch, there were solutions that I found about getting out. How do you get out of poverty? Because yes. I was, your people, I was homeless. Finally found an apartment. The government was trying to take my boys away. Well, not the government, actually. The the father was trying to take their, 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 my children from me because he was, he was now very wealthy and we know where their wealth came from. Mm -hmm. All right. And here I am sleeping on the floor with these two boys. We were on the floor for three years. y'all. When I say on the floor, I'm not talking about mattress. I'm talking about just, you know, shaking that light. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. And just laying there. But it was in the throes of all of this. I remember one night being in the deep freezer. I was rolling from one end to the other on the floor. Imagine that kind of pain that you would be in a deep freezer and you wouldn't even feel it. You won't feel the cold. And I yeah. said to God, we got two choices here. You either take me out right now or you show me how to get out of poverty. It, it's, it's the truth. We don't have any middle ground. Show me or you take me out. But God began to show me until it got to a place where I was getting excited just going, just simply, it was really weird. Just going into every night, the, the lady in the front, I'll just say, hey, good evening, good night. And I was getting excited just going into the deep freezer. <laughs> I mean, can you believe it? Who gets excited going into a deep freezer? Someone who loves themselves enough to realize that they're worth. God. And it was where God started talking to me. So I would just, I was always getting excited and I would sit down ready, just ready. And I would just hear all the things. And I'm telling, I cannot tell you the number of women that have written me and told me the journal that I've written. Uh, it also comes with, a, uh, with inspirational words that you can take to take to walk with you. Yes. And it's with the book. So many people call me now and say, thank you. Thank you. Because 
that was their torch that they were looking for. The stories that I put there showed them the, the, uh, the activities that I gave them there, the questions that I asked them really pushed them into a part where they have to say enough of surviving. I yes. can't keep in survival mode anymore. I need to thrive now. So if you are out there, it is important that you hear, hear, hear me and hear me clearly. You can thrive. You can. You've already survived. Okay. The fact that you're looking at me right now tells me you are surviving. Yes, you might be hurting. Before I got on today, I was hurting all over my body because I have fibromyalgia. But I'm here today. So we can survive. That's yeah. not the problem. The yeah. issue now is how can we leap, leap from survival to thriving? Yes. Yes, I'm so with you on that. I can even feel the energy of that. It's so amazing how when someone tells their story, it goes right through you because there are elements of it. We don't always understand the full capacity That's of right. what's going on in someone's life, but there are elements within your story that connects to each human being differently. And with that, we take that with us mm. and we thrive on that part. One of the things I do want to talk about again is so many people have so many things going on with them, like they have addiction or uh, substance abuse or trauma, like you say, eating disorders. One of the most popular ones is anxiety, yeah. which has blown up so much in the past couple of years, especially. Please talk to me about all of these symptoms that, that, that people have, but also how they can help themselves mm. to get through it. Because every day you take one day at a time. It's not about seeing the end of the tunnel straight away. There sure. is a process in each one of us that we must take. But how do you, mm. as a person, help people to see that they are have the ability to do this? I, I t thank you for that question because that's very important. Um, a lot of times people listen more when they know that you've been through something, right? Very true. So for someone like me, right, I've been through anxiety and I still have it, even as a psychiatric provider. Yeah. I still have it on a daily yeah. basis. Um, I've been through um, ADHD, right, um, mm -hmm. where as an African, you know, nobody even know what ADHD is. But I got here struggling in school, almost want to, get kicked out of college. I'm like, okay, let me go seek help. So I understand that. I've been through post-traumatic stress syndrome, which is PTSD, yes. right? And those who have post-traumatic stress, often people think that you have to be sexually molested to have it. No, it could just mm -hmm. even be the job that you have right now might be giving you insistence. <laughs> But that's the truth PTSD, right <laughs> so people always think that it has to be this massive thing but it can be your job it can even be your own child that is giving you ptsd on a daily basis it can be your relationship that's giving you ptsd on a, on a daily basis that's so true all right and those who have ptsd they often have anxiety ptsd does not stay by its own right post traumatic stress syndrome is always it comes with depression it comes with anxiety so that even coming out of covid many people are coming out of covid with anxiety they yes come out of covid with panic disorders they come in i happen to have eating disorder so you 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 kind of touch my buttons today all right i mm. i happen to be someone who suffer from eating disorder but i have overcome it Right, I've overcome it and I can teach other people. Once in a while, when stress comes in, yes, that could come up. But because I've learned to not to know my my signals, I could say, yeah. okay, stop it now, princess, because you no, know, this is gonna take you down the path that you don't want. But many of us out there do not know it. So some people who go through anxiety all of a sudden their heart rate start beating, boom, boom, boom. They might be laughing. Everybody might be laughing around them. They might actually be laughing with no problems and boom, something will just hit them in the heart. Yes. And so, wait a minute, where did that come from? Here's the thing that I teach a lot of my uh, patients, which they have actually, many of them have actually told me that they never thought about it before. Let me give you an, I like to give examples. There is a, I think it's 70 year old woman. I usually see across the lifespan. My youngest is three years old and my oldest is like 94, 95. 
or even more. And this lady, she tells me, she said at four, precisely 4 p.m. every now, every evening, she gets anxious. She said she just starts feeling sweating in her palm. Her heart rate is beating. She said she might be watching TV and that thing comes. So she said it, she first started by saying evening. So I said, well, I want you to map it for me. Yes. Go back and map and see. So for those of you who are hearing me right now, you can do it too. Mm -hmm. Go back and mark it. So when she marked it, she came back. She said, Dr. Hancock, do you know that it's always every 4 p.m. between 4 and 4.30, but mostly 4 p.m. that that thing happens. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. I just start feeling nervous, shaky, and all kind of stuff. I said, oh, okay. Can you think back? Is there something in your life that has happened there? She said, oh, no, nothing. I said, no, no, no. I want you to take, just take the week. Let's come back again. I want you to think back. Is there something that happened around that time? Well, she came back and said, oh, my God, I was at work. It was around 401 when I was mm. told that my husband had passed. Ah. I said, wow. So now because she knows the trigger, she's able to work on the trigger. Yes. That doesn't mean that the anxiety goes away completely, but she's able to work on the trigger. So that I often say to people, I also give, you know, I also prescribe, I say medication corrects, but therapy sustains what's corrected. Can I say that again? Mm -hmm. Medication corrects. So for those of us who are afraid of medication, I'm on medication. Hello, Teddy Vail. Okay. All right. I'm on I, that's what I tell my patients. I say, welcome aboard this ship because <laughs> I'm on medication, y'all. And, and it helps me, my fibromyalgia medication, Lyrica, it helps me to be able to get up and talk to you today. Exactly. I'm not on that medication, I won't be able to touch lives. You know, even that medication, somebody, gave, somebody God gave somebody that knowledge so that we need not be afraid of it. We need not be afraid of it. Many people who go the route of therapy, they've been sent back to me and said, Dr. Hanko, can you just put them on medication? Because they've been on, they've been going through this for two, three years now. And I'm going to get it anyway. And as soon as I give them that medication, they go back to their therapy and boom, things are happening for them. Yeah. Boom, things are happening. So whatever it is that you're going through, figure out your triggers. You might sit here and say, oh, I wasn't, I wasn't traumatized before. Uh, go, go back, sit down and, and start, get yourself a journal and start to write it. A lot of my patients today, they come back and tell me, oh my God, somebody died around this time. I actually had a woman that the son passed around 10 p.m. So she would she would walk all day. Everything is fine. But when it's time to sleep, that's when her anxiety comes up. She can't sleep. But it was because her son passed around that time. Uh -huh. PTSD, yo. So whatever it is that you're going through today, anxiety, there is help for it. Don't be don't be like ones who would be afraid of medication, afraid. Who cares if you're on medication? It's your life. No, exactly. you, don't have, you don't have to tell anybody you're on medication. I happen to tell people because I'm fine with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, you're free. You're free. Hey, and, it's part, and it's part of what I do. So I, I, I tell people, people come to me and they're afraid. And I say, hello, let's just, let's, let me help you out here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello, somebody. I'm on it. Okay. And they look at me like, Dr. Hackock, you actually tell us that. I said, why not? Why not? I'm free. Mm -hmm. Free. So a lot of the anxiety too, yes, situations around us stare at, but it's also a chemical imbalance. So that yes. if you have a chemical imbalance and you're just using therapy to sustain it, it's not sustainable, y'all. Okay. But if it's a chemical imbalance, which means there's something in your, in your, in your system called serotonin, you have a low, yes. it's low. So you need something to push it up. So when you have that medication, it doesn't have to, even have to be a high dose. I don't believe in high doses, frankly. You know, and you put a little bit on it, then you get therapy to deal with that PTSD 
symptoms that is driving your anxiety or depression. Yes. So, ladies and gentlemen, as you watch us or as you listen to us, I urge you because so many things are happening all over the world now. People are having suicidal thoughts, suicidal yes. ideation. Teenagers that are caught up in their rooms, not doing anything, they're ending up, you don't know the number of teenagers I have now, with suicidal tendencies. tendencies. I have even some that have homicidal, that they stay outside. If somebody's sitting right next to them, the only thing they want to think about is how to pound that person. And I'm talking about teenagers. I'm talking about people that have even seen a four-year-old try, attempted to hang himself. This is serious business that is going on all over the world now. So thank you for using your platform to share this. It, the more we talk, the more we communicate, the That's more right. we can help other people. The whole purpose of having these platforms is to help people, not to keep them to ourselves or just to put people on there because you know somebody who knows. No, it's about authentically helping people have a passion about helping people to save people's lives. So even if we come on this show today and we save someone's life, do you know how great that is? That's right. That's right. And that's, that's what, and that's what we need to do with all the, with all of our shows. We need to, regardless of even if your show was on, about business, with the life that we live right now, even within entrepreneurs, do you know that the 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 rate of suicidal uh, thoughts and ideation amongst our wealthy people it is tremendous. It is I mean absolutely tremendous, and it's tremendous because they have nowhere to go. Because yes. everybody looks at them like, oh, they, you look at them, lights, camera, uh, action, boom. And then all of a sudden you wake up and you see them in the paper, just completed suicide. And you're like, wait yes. a minute. I just saw him at the award show last night, smiling and okay. What do you, it's because they, because of the money, because of the, the, the personality and all the stigma that's on mental, mental illness too, they have nowhere to go. But do you know that some of them have told me that they go on YouTube, you know, the they, they kind of patients that I see is across board. I, I have people who are also multimillionaires that are mm. in the, that I, I'll tell you this, this particular person travel all over the, that times that person is in Spain calling me and saying, okay, I have a party tonight. I don't want to drink, but how do I do this? How do I maneuver my way? Because everywhere I go, there's drink. So there is the addiction going on of drink yes. because of the kind of job that he's doing because he's a big top person that and so I finally had to teach him a few things about wait a minute I do something like that too there's something called bio he says what's that I said well you just squat it it's fruit and it looks like wine it looks yes. like you know sparkling. You know what? You just, when they give you that glass, just say, oh, thank you. And you take your little cup. You go to the side. You look right to the left. You get you some water. And you squat, squat. And you join the party. And he does he does that now. It was like, oh, my God. I didn't think it was going to be easy. But I, I'm doing it. I said, good for you. So there's addiction going on out there now. There is suicidal tendencies out of, just out of, it's just out of touch out there. And the sad part is our teenagers, we need to keep up. If you're watching us and you have a teenager, you better keep a close eye on that teenager. Very if, true. If they're going into their room, closing the door and telling you don't, don't come in, you better go in. <laughs> you better find your way in. If you have to crawl in, crawl in and make, crawl. <laughs> and make sure that, that kid is safe. That is so true because teenagers hide so much. One of the things I've learned in life is that people hide so much behind a smile. And it's usually the people who laugh and smile the biggest right. and the brightest right. are the ones with the most pain. And right. you're right about the entrepreneurs because I've spoken to so much, so many of them. And one of the things that they do say to me privately after the show is that, Savia, I am the most loneliest person. And no one believes them because of the bright lights and everything that's in front of them and all, and all the paparazzi and, and the millions of views on Instagram or wherever it may be. But when all that is shut down and they are by themselves, they are the loneliest person 
ever and without having a faith or a belief or something to drive them that's what drives them to suicidal thoughts that's what drives them regardless of their talent that's what drives them to not want to be on the planet anymore because they don't know who they can trust that's right and and the thing is you have to have a big why right Mm -hmm. um i think you asked a question earlier about you know something similar to finding your big why and yeah you have to have a big why it was my big why that took me got me off of that ledge right yes. my yeah. big why were my children i looked at my children and i said i can't get, i can't leave them with this kind of legacy where they feel like it's their fault that their mom, mom completed suicide and so yeah. that was my big why to pedal back that i don't know what plan what life has for me but this much i knew I could not leave them with that kind of legacy. So yeah. I bowed back. And so many of us right now don't have a big why. You know, we have some excuses, some reasons to do this, some reasons to do that. Eh. And so because of that, we might do it, not do it. But when you have a big why, you wake up and that big why drives you. My big why drives me. My children now, they're over 30s, they're in their own home. So mm, thank you, God, for that. Yeah. But now I've created another big why, which is to touch lives with my own life stories. Yes. And the way that I do that is not only through my writing and through the movies and the documentaries that I do, but the other women that I also lift up. I mean, I, you know, Fearless Visionaries Chair the Veil is a project that I did about uh, right before the um uh, the pandemic. We actually traveled all over. We came to you, uh, London, and all travel. I took eighteen women from all over the world yeah. who have trauma, who's experienced trauma, and I brought them together. And I did. I, I published a collection of their stories, and they all became number one best-selling authors. Yes. And now they're thriving. They're doing that. Some of them have come on your show too. Yes, yes. They're doing and just doing beautifully, and it's such an honor to look at each and every one of their lives and say, wow, I had a path in this. I had a role in this. So it's not just what you're going through today. It's not just for you alone. All right. That's why you have to thrive. It's not just for you. You thrive because you know that at the end of the tunnel, there's somebody else waiting. There's somebody whose hands is doing this. Can you just touch me? Can you pull me out of my own so that I can thrive just like you are? And so being in psychiatry right now, seeing all these patients is just a blessing. I mean, when I look at the reviews that I get, it's just like, my God, I'm just doing what I'm called to do. They think it's something great, but to me, it's just like, wow, that I didn't even complete suicide. That now I'm in a position where I can say, take my hand and let me walk you through whatever that, that darkness is. Take my, you're, you're a four-year-old, take my hand. You're a 15-year-old, take my hand. You're 45, take my hand. And you're 70, 80, 90, here's take my, hand. my hand. Take my hand and let me help you. Do you know that there are some women who are in their 80s and now they're just finding themselves in their 80s? I in- believe that abundantly. I believe that abundantly. Whoa. Now that's why that's why I couldn't do this. That's why, oh my goodness. And now they're finding themselves. It's never too late. It's just never too late. We just have to make that decision because nobody's going to make it for us. We have to make that decision that regardless of yeah. how painful it is, I am going to thrive and I'm going to, I'm going to rewrite my story. My legacy is going to be strong and it's going to change the world. But it's a choice that you must make. Yes, I, hmm, I believe in that thoroughly. I believe in that. Another thing that connects with that is forgiveness. A lot of people, uh, oh, yeah, I know you know about this one. Forgiveness is one of the biggest key parts in our life. But it's not just about forgiving other people. It's also forgiving yourself for what you have been through. So let's talk about forgiveness because a lot of people find it hard to forgive other people, but they don't realize they also need to forgive themselves. That's right. Now, here's here's the thing about forgiveness. You have to first forgive yourself, right? Because a lot of times you're going to have problems forgiving others because you haven't even forgiven yourself. Yes, true. You know, some of us have not forgiven ourselves. Some of us don't even know or think we need forgiveness. <laughs> that right? is true. 
So when you don't know, even think you need forgiveness, you're so focused, right, on other people, right? Yeah. You know, you're focused on the speck out there, but the log is sitting right in the right, right there, but you can't even see it. So that when people are telling you, okay, have you forgiven yeah. yourself? You're looking at what do you mean by that? She did me wrong. He did me wrong. They did me wrong. So what are you talking about? Forgive myself. Yeah. You need to forgive yourself first. You need to learn to forgive yourself. It's, it's just like my ex now. I don't feel anything towards him anymore. I mean, it, it's such a freedom to yes. feel like, you know, nothing, just nothing, absolute nothing. And when, when I say nothing, I mean, he might, it, I don't even care if he thinks that he needs forgiveness or not. I'm forgiving him. You see what I mean? I like that. A, a, a lot of times we're waiting for somebody to, okay, I'll forgive you. Now let me look in the twinkle of his eyes, if, or, or her eyes, if, you know, if she yeah. takes the forgiveness. No. That's not that's not what forgiveness is about, you know. Either they think they need it, they don't think they need it. That's it. It has nothing, absolutely nothing, to do with you forgiving them. Mm -hmm. All right, you forgive yourself for your role in that situation, that fiasco. Because bottom line, I can think back to that marriage now, and I cannot say that I was a perfect little woman either. Yeah, yeah I made some mistakes. There were things that I needed to have done that I didn't do because of love. But there were things I needed to have put in place that I didn't. So there were so it, it's not about you trying to figure out, you know, how big is your sin compared to mine. But you look at your role in whatever that situation is and say, okay, God, I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry that I don't even love me enough. To even understand that when I was looking in the mirror, I was getting smaller and I didn't even realize it. Yep. I was getting smaller by every inch. Yep. Until I became a rug, until I became yep. a carpet. Uh -huh. That people were trampled over. And I didn't even recognize it because I had something in me that said, oh, I don't want people to hate me. You know, I just want to be this nice little whatever. So it's important that we first recognize for you to thrive, you have to first forgive yourself. Exactly. And as you forgive yourself, there's that freedom to now see, oh, I'm going I'm to forgive this person regardless. I'll forgive this because now you are light. You're no longer as heavy when you forgive it's yourself. True. You're not carrying that heaviness on your shoulder anymore. And so it's easy for you to say, I forgive you. Never mind you think you need forgiveness or not. I'm still going to do it and move on. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to park on it and wait to you to see any movement from you. I'm just going to forgive and move on. And, and when you do that, it opens the path for you to now see your future. Very yes. Good. yes. Another thing that tallies up with that is finding peace within yourself. So, uh, so let's talk about finding peace. My question for you is, when was the last time you felt totally at peace with yourself? When I forgave, actually, that's very good. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. When I forget, and I will never forget that night. And it, what was funny about that night was that mm -hmm. this particular person did wrong. Everybody around knew it was wrong. Mm -hmm. And... I remember rolling on the floor. It had to do with child support and alimony and all kind of stuff. Yeah. And I was asked to, <laughs> I was asked to, to pay a certain amount of money, which I knew it was supposed to be <laughs> in the, yeah, the other way. way around. And I'm looking and I'm saying, hmm. I could do a whole lot of mess. I could cause a whole heap of mess on this one. Like, okay, this is not right. But I found myself for two, three years just paying that money. Even though it was my money. <laughs> I was paying the money. And one night, I was on the floor. I said, okay, God, I know I've come to you in the deep freezer. This is how many years after past the deep freezer? Probably 10 years past the deep freezer. I said, okay, this has to stop. I've been divorced for how many years now? I said, at this point now, my kids will be getting married and I'll still be in, in court for child support or something. Mm -hmm. And I remember just sitting and I said, okay, 
you, you got to do this again, God. And this has to stop. And I heard the Holy Ghost say, forgiveness. That's your key. Yeah. Forgiveness. And I said, it was so hard to forgive in that kind of, you know, when you know that somebody really Ooh, put I know. Oh, put I know. Eye, and then God is telling you to for what? I, what? Really? I mean, I'm two years into paying what I had no business paying. And you say, forgive what? They should be not asking for forgiveness. What? And the Holy Ghost said, no, I'll teach you something about that. Forgive. And I forgive. Yeah. I left everything alone. Do you know? That after I forgave, it was barely 72 hours where the, the judge on the case got changed, <laughs> got removed completely. I didn't do anything about it. Got removed completely. They handed the case over to a woman, another woman in another place. And the woman started off and saying, I don't know the two of you. I don't know who's, who's lying. I don't know who's truth. But this much I tell you, this will be the last. I'm going to make sure that my... The, the result that comes out of this court will be the final one. It doesn't matter which country you go, Nigeria, Africa, anywhere. I'm going to make sure that mine, what I, the decision I reached to, to, on this case will be the final. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, God, I'm going to forgive now so that you can help me out with this one. <laughs> <laughs> I said, because if this woman goes and says something else, that might not be good. And do you know that that woman turned everything around, told told me I need to stop paying, told me he owes me money and say, you have a right to refile so that he can pay you back all the money. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I would never forget telling the court, uh, no, just free me. <laughs> yeah, that's all you need is the freedom. Because if I'm going back to court again now, this, this person might have another idea. agenda. So, mm -hmm. No, no, just free me, write it, done, that's it. So mm -hmm. what am I saying? Where am I sharing this? I'm sharing this to women that there are times God will ask you to forgive in the middle of the pain. In the middle of your pain and your, 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 your sense in your spirit forgiveness, that is the toughest time that you can forgive, but that is the best time to give. forgive. Yeah. It's tough. But when you forgive, I'm telling you, doors open. Yes, that's when true. When you forgive, doors open. You know those doors that are banging and banging all of a sudden? A door we open here, another door we open there. Because yeah. you have learned to live in perfect peace and harmony. Yes. And forgiveness brings perfect peace and harmony. That is true. That is so true. Before we both forget, I remember you talking about how you had your fortune, but your fortune was taken away with you, mm. but also educating women on mm. how to know what their numbers are and calculate those numbers in their heads so that they will thrive, not survive, just like you say, to, fr <laughs> to thrive in what they do, but to be consistent in thriving so that nobody can take it away from them because... A big part of what we call love is manipulation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And sometimes us as kind, compassionate human beings, when we love someone, we are easily conformed to be manipulated right. and right. we give them our all. Right. And I know a lot of people will resonate with this because it's very, very true. Right. So please break down about how to teach. It doesn't matter man or woman because oh, it doesn't I matter who we are. I was about to say that. It doesn't matter. We can all be manipulated by someone if we care and love them enough. Love is a very powerful thing, but it's also a way of conforming us to be someone that we are not when somebody has the power to transform us into that person. But from your perspective, understanding, and in your opinion, how can we learn to hold our power of what we deserve? Okay, so... When you come together as a union, a lot of times people say, oh, I made my second half, right? Mm -hmm. But the truth is, you're not supposed to be married to your second half. You're supposed to be married to a whole person. Let me there just say go. that again. There you go. You have to be whole. In my first marriage, I thought it was my second half. I went into the marriage thinking, oh, I met my second half. Oh, So which means that 
where you you're enmeshed instead of coming together as a union you're actually enmeshed and when you talk about enmeshed is an unhealthy relationship from day one yes all right because i'm a half she's a half and so when you come together everything blends in in a way that is just unhealthy yes. but when you have when you are a whole person you're coming in there with your own bank account is coming with his own bank account. You can decide to have one joint account. You have, you still have your own account. They have their own account, and you come together, understanding yes what you all have, what you're coming yes. up. With. Now they don't have to be wealthy. Let me just say that this is not about oh I have to marry a multimillionaire because I I gotta tell you I've dated one before. I've dated and it, it doesn't really uh let me mm -hmm. just tell. Let me tell you, mm -hmm. they, they might be multimillionaire, but they're the kind of worst ones to marry, frankly, because when they think that they've had, had it all, then you become eh, whatever. You become changeable every six months because they don't, they don't have to be with you because what's that for? So we're not talking about looking for, sure. you know, looking for the, you know, multimillionaire to marry, but we're talking about coming together in profit unity you are a whole person that person is a whole person you come together understanding what each other have yes you have that knowledge and that understanding you also have your own too right now i you know i have a husband now that thank god we've been married for at least 25 years now wow. and i'm telling you he's not perfect i'm not perfect hey well, my goodness we're perfect for each other there you go that's enough can I just tell you that? We are so perfect for each other. And when I first met him, money was my issue because of when I started looking at my papers and I found out, like, dang it, my first school was actually make, making, and we're talking about in the uh, early 20, 2000s, my, my, the first school was making over 500000 a year for the first year, then it moved to a million. I did not even know. I was just working. I was waking up, going to work. I was not, I did not pay attention. You've got to learn to pay attention. Anybody who loves you will love the fact that you pay attention. So yes. when I met, first, my, when I met my, my second husband, I told him, brother, uh, the major problem I had the first time was finances. I ain't going there again with nobody. Okay. Nobody, nobody, and he didn't understand. It. He was like, "What do you mean by that?" I said, "Well, uh, what you coming? What you coming with? Okay, let me let let let's see what you coming with. And if it's zero, that's fine too. But at least I need to know. Okay, mm. and if I'm coming with negative ten, eh, okay, you know, I'm not gonna put something under the rug and then mm. find out that you know you go find out down the road when we're married that." <laughs> <laughs> your negative 20. <laughs> and so I told him, point back, I said, look, I, I have a problem putting joining things together. And which was, yeah. I just had that problem and I explained it to him. And mm -hmm. this, this beautiful man, we weren't even married then. And he surprised me. He would take his check, his annual, his uh, monthly check, and he would deposit it into my account. Is he would deposit, and I said, Why are you doing that? He said, Because I want you to trust me. He said, and I said, But you work for it. That's not we're not even married. You don't know what I'm gonna do with you. He said, He says, I want to teach you how to trust and how, yes, to, I like that. how to love the healthy way and trust. So here's my check. You just give me anything. I'll tell you what when I need something. I need $20 a month a week. Just I'll tell you. And he did that for like two years before I started to now calm myself down. Yeah. So now, that would not happen for everybody, right? But what I'm saying is, whatever you have or not have, know what you have or not have. True. Don't run into a relationship, right? If you have a debt, let the other person know, I got, I got some debt. If mm. he or she is able to help you with it, then you come together as one and do it. But you cannot have a business and not even know how much is coming in. It's, it's just utter craziness.
which was what I did. I was crazy back then. I was just crazy in love. I don't know what, I don't even know if you call that love, frankly. I don't know what it is, <laughs> you know. <laughs> now I don't know, I can tell you that I don't even know what that was. I was just crazy, period. You need to know. So for women and men that are out there, know, you know, it's even in the Bible. It said, who is going to build a house and not even count the cost, right? Can I you see. build a house and not count the cost? You got to count the cost. So it's important that you know what you have. Every dime that is coming to you, you need to learn. We all need to learn that. So that when you meet your partner, you are with your partner, you guys can gel together because yes. you have the knowledge of what this person have, what that person have. Nobody's hiding anything down the road. We know. Do you know the number of women that their husbands have passed or even the vice versa where that person passes and now they're stuck? They don't know what they have. They don't know who has what. They don't know if their husband or their wife kept something in the bank account. They have absolutely no clue. We should never be living our lives like that. That is so true. That uh, Listen, one thing I've learned in life is trust isn't, but I do it the other way around, which some people might find quite confusing. So when someone comes to me, I give 100% trust and I let them do as they will with it. I know people think that's absolutely crazy to do, but it's not in my world because I've learned how to love myself and how to honor myself and give that trust to someone else. Whatever they do with that trust is up to them. It's up to them. That's right. That's right. It's up to them. So what yeah. you said that's right. yeah. is abundantly true. So I've only got two more for you. But yeah. my second to last question for you, I remember we spoke in the beginning about legacy and, and your family being such a prime part of your life. Actually, the, the most prime part of your life. Yeah. From hearing your legacy of what happened previously and what could have happened, mm -hmm. how do you see your legacy now? And what would you like your legacy to be when you and only you, with your permission, decide that that is enough you want to relax you want to to be have the gratitude and the worship that you believe you deserve on yourself and mm -hmm. for your family what would you like your legacy to be you you have let's let's do this you you have to continually leave your legacy right, right. a lot of times people look at legacy as oh when you are passed and that's oh. it but I believe that right now for me, I am leaving my legacy. It's not just in psychiatry. I'll give you an example about uh, two days ago, I sent a, I have a team in Nigeria that goes and does nonprofit work for me. Yes. And, they, and, and I woke up just thinking about, you know, orphanage. Um, every year for the last 20 years now, I have children all over um, Nigeria that I, that I have sent to school. And it's just, it just blesses my heart when they find me on Facebook or find me on social and say, oh, we finished our college now. And it just blesses yeah. my heart. But about three days ago, I just had this orphanage thing. And I reached out to my team. I said, can you find me an orphanage? And they found me an orphanage. And, and, and two days ago, they went in there, but they could not take the pictures of the beautiful children. Yes. But they put them on video and they sang. And when they were singing, I was just, my eyes were just like shot. I was just... Oh, my goodness. It blessed my heart to just see those beautiful soul. And it, that afternoon, they went to the widows in some parts of my community mm -hmm. and also did some things that I sent to them. That's my legacy now. To be able to take the little that I have and be able to change somebody's life so that when my time has passed, I want people to say, she made a difference in my life. Very true. If it, was, if it was not for her, I would not have completed college. Mm -hmm. If it was not for her, I would not be the kind of woman or man that God has called me to today. And so this is what I see in my legacy. When I help other women to write their stories, I'm part of that too. I'm part of their journey. Yes. I'm part of somebody's journey. That is the legacy that I see for myself, being part of somebody's journey. Because frankly, with mine, I've been blessed. It's been rough. I cannot sit no. here and 
told you, oh my God, everything just went smoothly. No, oh my goodness, it's been rough. And oh, by God's grace, I would not even be sitting here in front of you today. Oh, very true. And so when I think about that, I don't want pain to just be part of my legacy, but I want people to look at what was painful about my life and use it as a tool to mm. thrust themselves into mm. victory, thrust themselves into success, either at home, life, business, career, whatever it is. Every part of my life, I wake up now saying, wow, who can I touch? Yes. And that's the legacy. That's the legacy. I'm leaving my legacy right now. That's enough. That is enough. Yeah. Literally, that is abundantly enough. My last question for you is, could you please tell us where we can find you, where we can buy all your books, uh, <laughs> where we can just hear more about you, where we can embrace you, where we can support you. Wow. Well, uh, where books are concerned, Amazon is the best. Just put F-U-M-I, Hancock, yes. H-A-N-C-O-C-K, F-U-M-I, Hancock, and they all will come out. I just wrote a book on narcissism. and yes. So if you're going through narcissistic behavior if you're the one going through it or somebody else that you think might be going through it that might be a great book to pick up so that you can know oh my goodness if you're spinning yeah. you know spinning around a, a narcissistic person huh that might teach you something. <laughs> i like the way you said that mm. okay, yeah. <laughs> you know and then of course my website is dr for me f-u-m-i psych dmp p-s-y-c-h dmp.com there you're going to find a lot of uh, media uh, stories there. You're going to find a lot of the books. You're going to find some, some stories about my podcast. And of yes. course, the uh, show that I do, The Princess of Suburbia, uh on YouTube. You can find it there. And it's also on International Diaspora Network on YouTube. So, but most importantly, just Google Dr. F-U-M-I Hancock, H-A-N-C-O-C-K. And of course, you know, whatever floats your boat you'll find it there <laughs> <laughs> oh dear dr princess fumi you have my utmost gratitude kindness compassion i want to thank you for being so honest so open and willing to tell your story to share and to save people's lives but also to help show them that they can thrive in anything that they believe in their heart that they can do thank you so much for coming on the show thank you so much for having me Take you're care. more than welcome you too guys i want to thank you so much for listening to the us people show please remember you can subscribe and leave us a review on any platform that you prefer listening to guys as always please remember to tune in every thursday at 8 p.m to see us live and once again guys thank you so much for listening stay happy Stay positive and as always, please continue to be kind to one another. Take care.